Kota Katoa. Um, welcome to the University of Canterbury. Um, my name is Sarah Young. I'm, I'm the Executive Dean of Science, the Science Faculty here at the University. And it's my great pleasure to host and welcome you this evening. Um, today's gathering holds significance that resonates far beyond the boundaries of this room. We have the privilege of coming together, not only to unravel the mysteries of the cosmos and, the, and immersing ourselves in this awe-inspiring discoveries that Professor Kerr, his groundbreaking work has unlocked, but let us also recognise that this lecture is a poignant part of our university's 150th year commemoration, and, and it helps to continue to ignite the spirit of our ongoing journey of excellence, innovation and growth. Now, Professor Kerr's uh, enduring connection with the University of Canterbury, I thought, began in 1951, but Roy has just informed me that his grandmother here um, was one of the first uh, female graduates of this university, I think, in 1898. So he's had a very long association uh, with the university. But Roy earned a Bachelor of uh, Science in 1954 and a Master's of Science in 1955. He then pursued a PhD at the University of Cambridge, completing it in 1959. After Cambridge, uh, Roy moved to the, university, uh, the USA, um, working as a postdoctoral fellow in Syracuse, New York, alongside Professor Peter Bergman, Einstein's uh, collaborator. In 1963, while at the University of Austin in Texas, Roy achieved which, uh, what had eluded scientists for 47 years, discovering the solution to Einstein's equations defining space around a rotating star or a black hole. Returning to New Zealand uh, and the University of Canterbury in 1971, um, Roy became a mathematics professor for 22 years and obviously nurtured um, links, close associations with both physics and astron the astronomy department. His seminal work underpins much research and teaching in this field. Roy's breakthrough, known as Kerr geometry, revolutionized astrophysics and is still re re revolutionizing astrophysics, fundamental physics and cosmology. Now, as you can imagine, an academic of Professor Kerr's standing has meant that he has received a large number of awards over his career, so many so that I think it would take me 15 minutes to go through them all. But there are some significant highlights. He received in 1984 British Royal Society's Hughes Medal. He received in 1993 the New Zealand's Royal Society's Rutherford Medal. In 2011, he became a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit. Importantly, he went on to receive the Crayford Prize from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in 2016 for his fundamental work on rotating black holes. And in the same year, he earned the title of Canterbury Distinguished Professor, which is the highest title awarded by this university. His exceptional contributions continue to garner recognition, as demonstrated by his election to the Fellow of the Royal Society of London in 2019, and his receipt of the Oscar Klein Medal in 2020. So it's my great pleasure um, to welcome first Professor um, David Wiltshire, who is the chair of tonight's uh, meeting and talk. Thanks, David. Uh, so my role is just to, to point out a few um, procedural matters, as well as inviting Roy on. Um, uh, since Roy does have a few lapses of names, but all the rest is fine, um, he asked me to help him de-stress by, uh, if he re remembers dog person, I say Thibaut de Moore, right? This, um, Thibaut's, um, well, it's, it's all about golden retrievers, which Roy's wife uh, bred. But in, anyway, uh, so there, there are a lot of ways in which uh, I'm just going to help him by prompting if needed. Um, so that's just a plain little thing that's going on. Um, uh, at the end, uh, Roy's actually going to present a special prize to one of our students. So uh, 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 
Between that and the questions, there's going to be a special presentation as well by Roy. Um, and so I think with that, we can more or less start. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have my mind, Professor Roy Kerr, Catholic Research Professor, to come to the podium. Well, <laughs> I hope to keep the equations to a minimum tonight. In fact, there'll be no equation you have to take any notice of. But I have put some slides in that people abroad can look at, but I'll skip over here. Uh, anyway, to start off with, that's my grandmother. She was a remarkable woman. Uh, Let's see, one of these buttons takes me up and down. I was told which one. <laughs> Next page. Oops, all right. I, I've got a few problems. <laughs> <laughs> you can see we're really organised. Those two, sorry. Yeah. Oh, those, they did, it didn't work. It on okay, we'll now. Okay. <laughs> I thought I'd say quite a bit about my life because uh, that's very much tied up with my successes. Okay, I, I was born in Kurao during the big slump, the 1934, when uh, there were a tremendous number of people out of work and that's where my father was. Uh, we then moved to Gore and I was there uh, right through World War II. Uh, in '39, my father went to, into the army, he was a volunteer, and I lived with a farming family. Uh, and we, we, they moved into town and I went to the Gore Primary School. Now, in '46, <coughs> uh, I moved to Dunedin. That was about the time my father got back from World War II. If you don't know, it took a long time to get the men back from that war. So I moved there, studied for a year at a high school there, Targa Boys High. Then we moved to Christchurch. Uh, now what was interesting about it is that St Andrews at that time had no money. I think the fees were probably a fifth or a seventh of what they are today in real terms. So you can see money was short. Also there weren't many teachers around, they were dead. You know, all the teachers were in the front, Pe people pushed them to the front and they got shot. So uh, we had no physics teacher, a 19th, cen a 19th century chemistry, well that's what it was, was taught by an ex-lawyer and higher level math by the pastor. Now this I tell people was one of my great advantages because I didn't have people telling me rubbish all the time. Okay, I could just ignore these, uh, particularly when the pastor was talking at, about other things. Uh, in 51, I started at Canterbury University College, and uh, because of my fantastic education at high school, I was put into third year maths the first year. Uh, it's not there, but in my second year, the dean came to me and said, why didn't you apply for a, a scholarship which would have taken me to Cambridge? And I said, well, I couldn't because I hadn't graduated. And he said that he and the math professor had agreed that if I applied, I would get it. So nobody got it and uh, that was too bad. So I waited around and played billiards and all sorts of other games for three years because there was no... There, wasn't, there weren't even books in the library. There was one book in modern phys physics, and that was probably 30 years old, and that was written by Sir Arthur Eddington, who was one of the very best of the theoretical relativity and cosmology people in the world. It was, Sir Arthur Eddington was the, uh, the person who led a, uh, an expedition to Brazil uh, to look at the uh, at uh, the stars from behind, behind the sun to calculate bending of light. 
during an eclipse, you can only see stars close to the sun if it's eclipsed out. So anyway, that was my undergraduate stuff. So finally, I, I get bored and I discover that marriage and stuff like that. <laughs> Got married before I left New Zealand. And uh, yes, then off to Cambridge. Now, what was I going to do? Well, obviously, my background wasn't all that great in modern mathematics, but the thought of spending two more years to do an advanced undergraduate course wasn't appealing. So I, I hummed and I hard, and my tutor hummed and hard, and I decided to do a PhD and just uh, wing it, pick up stuff as I went along. So that's what I did. Well. Uh, so, one of the first things we did was we bought a house. I'm probably 22 by then, so we naturally, like all 22-year-old students, I bought, we bought a house in uh, Grantchester Meadows, actually. That's misspelled. Uh, okay, so here I am, totally uneducated, really, know nothing. Uh, so the, my first supervisor was Philip Hall, who was one of the best algebraists in the world at the time, professor there. And uh, we, we started in, he was in group theory. And uh, the, uh, uh, I decided in the end I was more interested in physics. Uh, I won't tell you any more about it. Yeah. And then I was given Abdus Salam, who I'm not sure if I ever met, but I possibly did. I mean, given a supervisor didn't necessarily mean I got to see it. Uh, quantum mechanics. Couldn't stand it. All these particles. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, the whole Greek alphabet. And I was supposed to remember which was which. Well, you know, I can do a lot of things, but I can't remember that sort of stuff. So then I was, he, he went off. He was disgusted and he took a job elsewhere as a professor in uh, London, I think. David Camden. I'm not even sure that was his first name. I only <laughs> saw him once. Uh, I looked up Camden on, yeah, on the internet and there was a David Camden who probably was the person there, but uh, I only saw him once. Uh, he worked in quantum mechanics and so he had nothing to do with my thesis. So what we've got here is somebody who knows nothing. Well, I was picking up stuff. But I, I hadn't been spoiled by listening to people. So uh, I met a fellow student, John Moffat, uh, who uh, was one of the people who developed MOND, which is a replacement for general relativity for describing uh, the, the motion in galaxies. And uh, he, he had a unified field theory that she was trying out. And uh, basically, he just took G mu nu, the metric, and made it a complex metric, symmetric complex. OK, and we, together, we uh, had a look at the forces between the charged particles in this system. And gee, it seemed to be just exactly the electro electromagnetic forces. But uh, I then uh, realized and told him that, hey, you haven't actually got enough field equations. You've got uh, a lot of variables, but not enough equations. I mean, the theory wasn't any good. So he went on to other things. Now, one for calculating the equations of motion. That we used works by Einstein, Infeld and Hoffman from the mid-30s. And uh, Infeld in particular has spent 20 years trying to sort out these, uh, how you could get the equations of motion for a pair of particles using this theory. Um, they couldn't make it work. What, what he got and what Einstein and everybody else was getting was that in the first approximation, the particles just went along in straight lines. Fair enough. Then 
they calculated the second order effect and they got Newtonian force. But the trouble was, they didn't get the meatball, <laughs> they got them separate. So they had to have straight line motion and no force. There was obviously something wrong with the theory. And they were, there were a lot of papers written about it. So I hadn't been ruined by actually listening to people before. So I attacked this problem, but I attacked it my own way. And uh, uh, which was very successful, and I showed that, uh, well, for people who know projective geometry, there were basically two obstructions to it, and which were the equations of motion. I also uh, showed that they had missed angular momentum and the, uh, the, the equations for spin of bodies, which was significant in my later life. Uh, anyway, John, John Moffat uh, is, well, he's probably a quite old boy now. He must be over 50. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, he uh, has ended up in Canada at, uh, the, oh, there's a big institute up there <laughs> that uh, I, ca I can't remember. Uh, yeah. Okay, Cambridge years. I researched the two-body problem. That was it. Ignore all that stuff. Yeah, that explains it for people who are interested. So I also developed a method for the fast approximation. That was slow motion. Now, the fast approximation hadn't been done, and I showed that there were equivalent equations there, and I solved them for the low, in the lowest order. Uh, I might say all this work was totally ignored. And the people, <laughs> because I made the fundamental mistake, okay, I didn't have a supervisor who went around telling everybody how marvellous I was and I would tell how marvellous he was and we would tell all our friends how marvellous each other was and that's how it works. But uh, too bad. So that, um, from there I went to Syracuse, okay. Now, Peter Bergman was using work of Dirac. Dirac had uh, a theory of uh, uh, first class and second class constraints and all this, which was beautiful work. And Bergman and the whole group were trying to quantize general relativity using, well, they were using non-standard methods, Lagrangian, and they thought they could calculate the commutators. So I thought at one point, oh, what the hell, I'm going to do this calculation that they're all avoiding. So I got this huge sheet of paper, really, uh, I don't know what it's called, it's four times the size of an ordinary sheet. And I started off in the top left-hand corner and I wrote a little bit. And then I, I thought, started thinking and I realised you couldn't do this. It was all tautological, which it meant it was biting its own tail, but it was never going to come out and do anything. So I told uh, Bergman this, and whether he believed me, I don't know, but the, it all fell to bits and it never, it never did work. So I, I uh, was then offered a, a lot more money to go to uh, Dayton and work in, uh, with Josh Goldberg who was also from Syracuse and was uh, a good relativist. Uh, the, uh, the one thing we did do was uh, we calculated as the asymptotic electromagnetic field, which is something that, like what the boys are doing here, sorry, the men, but anybody in the 50s a boy. So, <laughs> so that, a bit like what they're doing there. But again, it was actually me who used this totally different way of doing the problem. Uh, then I met Alfred Schultz, and he had talked the Texas state, something or other, to uh, give a hell of a lot of money to the University of Texas for four research institutes, okay, which included cosmology and relativity. And so I was invited for a year as a visitor because people like uh, uh, 
Roger Penrose, he was going to go, but he couldn't go that year till the next, and, uh, and others. So I went. And uh, then I just constructed the Kerr metric in this time, so they gave me tenure as an associate professor. I actually went back to Dayton in the summer, and I told uh, Josh, well, I sort of hummed and hard about leaving him there and going off, and it turned out he was offered a job in, uh, back in Syracuse, but he had told them he wouldn't go if I didn't go. So we decided that he would go his way and I would go mine. Okay. I better get on. Conformal tensor. Okay. Mathematics. Ignore all this. At this time, a, a Russian Petrov had had a look at the algebra of the, of the curvature tensor in the Riemannian space. And he had done a lot of algebra and uh, he had found that just like a matrix problem, if you've done matrices, where you can have eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you've got the same sort of thing in uh, relatively, get that off the screen, naughty, naughty <laughs> equations. So, so he, he classified all possible curvature tensors. And what was found was there were four, four special light rays, eigenvectors. And uh, what was observed was all the known solutions had two of them the same, which is a repeated eigenvalue, eigenvector. Uh, that was just by chance, and the reason all of the all had that was there were only two solutions known of any consequence: Schwarzschild and the plane fronted way. So it wasn't too surprising. Now. This problem when you have two of these the same was called algebraically special. And Ivor Robinson and Andre Troutman had, had found a whole class of solutions of the Einstein equations for when this repeated vector was actually a gradient. Physically, there was nothing there. Okay, it's, nobody would study it now because although it was all beautiful, it was beautifully useless. Uh, like my cat. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that uh, now at, that brings us to the problem that at something more general than what Robinson and Troutman did. And uh, I was looking around this area, but <clears throat> there was a group in Pittsburgh who claimed to have solved the uh, oh. Yeah, that, there's a sentence there that was belonged to the next lot. Newman, Nontini, and Tamburino. They used some work of Newman and Penrose, and they claimed to have solved the more general problem. And they wrote a big paper on it, and uh, uh, with only one tiny, rather uninteresting solution of the equations at the end. Now, I didn't believe this because of... I'd been looking around the area, and that just seemed ridiculous. Uh, but the field believed it because there were people all over the country who were taking this, their results and working on them. And uh, it, uh, the problem was I couldn't see the paper because I was out in Texas, and uh, it, nobody had sent me a preprint. But finally, a copy came in, and. Uh, Uh, I finally got this preprint in '63, and because Alfred Child was supposed to review it, he looked at us and said, oh, "Bugger that!" and moved, gave it to uh, Alan Thompson, a, re a postdoc, and he knew I was interested, so he gave it to uh, me to look at. Now everybody else has had a chance to look at this paper. Now, I didn't believe it, so how did I look at it? Well, I took it, and they were using a whole Greek alphabet. It was just like uh, quantum mechanics for me. But for every, instead of having vectors with components, 
X1, X2, X3, X4. No, they gave them all n names like Bill and Jack and Freddie. And I, <laughs> anyway, it was ridiculous. So I read their paper by thumbing through because all I wanted to see was where was an equation which said that everything was rubbish and, you know, everything collapsed. So I get to this equation which, in which N1 and N2 and N3 are numerical numbers like one-third, four-thirds, minus a third, or whatever. Okay, and the sum of the numbers wasn't equal to zero. So I thought, what is this equation? And of course, it's full of all these names. So I, I put them into my own notation with actual indices, and I realized it's what's called a Bianchi identity. And they'd already written down the results of that earlier, so they'd calculated the same equation twice, and got different answers, which is definitely a no-no in a mathematical <laughs> problem. Uh, so, now, I didn't need to do any calculation, but my neighbour, Alan, who, Alan Thompson, lived right next to me, when I told him the paper was wrong, he, uh, he had to calculate one of the numbers, the first one, just to check, because he didn't see why I could tell it was wrong without doing a calculation. So we calculated the first one and it was wrong and the sum was zero. So good. At that point I went right ahead and solved all the equations. Okay, let's get on. Oh, let's get back. <laughs> <laughs> I got back and I solved the problem of all the, of the getting the field equations for such a metric. Well, as you can see, you don't want to know. Uh, I didn't want to know. Now, clearly, we weren't going to solve those because they, there were integrability conditions of them which you had to see. So I made, I chose the coordinates better and I got it down to this, which doesn't look so bad. And then I could do something with one of the variable, make it one, and I got down to this stuff, I should, you can't see that, can you? Oh. oh, yeah. I got down to this, which is a lot simpler than it used to be. Okay, that was great. What the hell was I going to do with that? So, the one thing that... By the way, everybody else in the field had the same chance to read that damn paper and see that it was rubbish. But I've got a theory that nobody looks at equations in papers. And with all the students over there, <laughs> they keep putting equations up on the board from the, you know, they put the pages of the papers they're reading up on the board full of equations. I know they well, they haven't checked one of them. I can assure you at least 35% are wrong. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So, that, here was where I came in. I was probably the only one in the world who knew how to handle symmetries, that you didn't just look at the... There are things called tensors and there are things called objects, and objects are much more general than tensors. So, you can tell a lot about the symmetries from other objects. So, I went ahead, and this is just for anybody who's looking in, I first of all, I, I got them independent of time. Oh, hell, the equations were still no good. I got them independent of an actual vec coordinate. So it's like, you know, this. It's, uh, God, that was a good idea. Uh, it's, it's cylindrically symmetric. Okay, that. Things are getting easier, but uh, they're not so good. And then... Uh, but I could solve all the equations there. And that was finally it. And then I thought, OK, but if I'm going to get something physical, it's got to be asymptotically flat. So at this point, almost all the, of the metric disappeared. And what I had left was the Kerr metric. So all the rest had been thrown away. It's like you've got a shovel and you're digging out a nice little jewel there and you're steaming the other stuff 
in the hole which you're burying Newman in. <laughs> he was the guy that got it wrong. And by the way, he never forgave me, and would you believe it, this guy wrote letters over the years to people like the Nobel Committee and to uh, uh, the places where I did get results, the Crawford Prize and everything else, explaining why I shouldn't get it. <laughs> so there you go. So we got the Kerr metric and is it rotating? If it wasn't rotating, well, ho hum, you know, it wouldn't matter. Now, I was very interested in rotation from my work with equations of motion. And uh, so there we had this enormous calculation to calculate the rotation. Alfred Schild, who was the director of the place I was at, I told him, I'm going into my office to calculate its rotation. And he said, great, I'm coming too. So here I am at my desk and I'm writing away. And right there is Alfred Schild in an old armchair, puffing away on, I thought it was a pipe. People tell me he smoked cigarettes. Perhaps he made an, an exception for this guy. So it didn't take long, because that's all the calculations was, really. I'm pretty much the whole lot there. Because of my work on the two-body problem, I knew what the field of a rotating body looked like at large distances. Okay? And that meant I just had to make a tiny little change in the coordinates at those distances, and I could see whether it was rotating. And sure enough, at one point, I turned to Alfred and said, it's rotating. And boy, he was excited. He was more excited than I was, because he knew people had been searching for this for a long time. OK. Now, the, uh, at this time, I'm just going to look to see. Oh, yeah. I'll explain later why why this symposium was held. Now, they had just discovered quasars. Quasars are enormous, uh, supermassive black holes, we now know, who are eating everything around them and pouring energy out into space. Uh, they were discovered, can I just look ahead? Yeah. They're in the wrong order. They were discovered uh, in a funny way, they, they saw them through a radio telescope. They saw one, okay? Lots of radio waves coming in because they were emitting in the radio spectrum. And uh, they, they, uh, they radio telescopes are not good at locating things because the wavelength is almost the same size as the telescope. And that, that for technical reasons, you, you don't know where the hell you're picking up this radio sound from. So there was a great idea uh, to find out which source it was. They thought it was a star. So it was suggested that they get down to the Parkes Telescope in Australia and watch when there's a, uh, when this radio wave appears from behind the sun. They know it's somewhere in this region and the sun's going to air across that region and then whatever it is that's emitting is going to pop out. So they do that and it works. The head of the institute there actually took out a uh, very large <laughs> spanner and undid the, the bolts to drop that uh, screen. Sorry, I should... Oh well, to drop this down so it's almost vertical because the sun was very low in the sky when this uh, object was coming up. Well, to cut a long story short, they uh, discovered it wasn't a star at all. It was a very distant galaxy that was pouring out this uh, energy in the radio spectrum. Now, what the hell were they? So that was where 
this meeting came in. Okay, there's a very strange, it was just when I found this rotating solution, this happened. So the first Texas Symposium was set up. Okay, and uh, there was a lot of theories, but nobody had a clue, really, what it was. The, the only person was Hoyle, who suggested there could be a million solar mass star of some form or other, but uh, it couldn't be a black hole because fourth field black holes don't exist. They're not, they're not rotating. So I, I give this talk on rotating sports deals. Uh, and uh, I'm ignored by the, the real physicists. Ah, this rubbish. Papa Petru, who was uh, one of the most outstanding relativists and did a, a lot of brilliant work in this area, he uh, was so infu infuriated, he got up and he started shaking the fist at the at these astronomers and astrophysicists, but it did no good. As a result, I was so put out I couldn't even spell. Sure. <laughs> uh, I only did that about 20 minutes ago. So, <laughs> this, um, I had to put a picture of the crab because that was the, uh, why is that thing on top? I don't know. That, uh, a thousand years ago, the Chinese noticed this in the sky. Huge light came out. Ah, brilliant. There, press escape. <laughs> okay, thank you. They saw a, a, a supernova. A really bright light in the sky for almost a year, then it faded away. That's what we see now. It's a beautiful picture. Of course, the colours are all made up because uh, the frequencies are actually not things that the eyes can see. Anyway, I had to put that picture in. That's the Parkes telescope. Just, this is actually a, a backyard telescope. Got a picture of that. Uh, well, there's an arrow there. The uh, that's. 3C273, the quasar. Okay, enough of that. What does the curve thing look like? Well, I'm going to spend quite a while describing what it is. You've probably heard about event horizons. There's an event horizon around the black hole. Now, it was the Kerr solutions got two event horizons. Now, I'll explain why this is happening. Suppose you've got a very heavy neutron star. Now, neutron stars are only perhaps 10 miles across, you know, and they can be uh, much heavier than the sun. So they're very, very condensed. If they collapse too much, then they uh, continue to collapse and a black hole forms. <coughs> the, you'll probably have heard about singularities in black holes. You know, that's really good stuff. Singularities in black holes. In 64, Roger Penrose wrote a paper in which he, he didn't even claimed to prove that singularities existed. He claimed something about null rays, about light rays. Uh, you, there's no distance along a light ray because the distance is zero. So you haven't really got a good parameter on there, but there's one that you can set up by, which is called an affine parameter. And the big difference between that and distance is distance satisfies the first order differential equation and this other thing satisfies the second order, which you won't see in any books because I don't know, you just don't. So it turns out that this solution is full of vectors that, uh, that are of finite, affine length, whatever that means. It doesn't matter, it could be gobbledygook just as long as, you know, it's full of them. 
Penrose and Hawking and, and the field believed that for no apparent reason that if this happened to a light ray that its affine number got, didn't go to infinity, it's, it was bounded, that there had to be a singularity at the end. Well, it was all in their brains because there's a, an infinite number. There are, I'll show you at the end a picture of one of them. So, what happens? You've got this uh, neutron star spinning like crazy. You know, as you pull in your arms when you're skating, you skate faster and faster. Now, this, this little devil has pulled its arms in an incredible amount. So, the outside is travelling as an appreciable fraction of the velocity of light. You know, it's really going. Uh, now, Einstein said years ago, forget the geometry, I'm paraphrasing it, forget the geometry, it's forces that count. Relativity is about forces, not about geometry. The geometry is just secondary. And this is a good case where you should think this way, because for bodies, there are three sorts of forces to consider. There's the Newtonian type long uh, 1 over r squared forces. Okay. For a localized body, the field is pretty much a 1 over r squared field as far as other particles are concerned. That gives you the force on a, on a uh, spaceship out there. Now, there are centrifugal forces. The forces of rotation, which tend to throw things off the surface. If you want to take a rocket up, up off of the Earth, you don't launch it at the North Pole. You get as close to the equator as you can, and you go with the motion, because that gives you some an initial impulse in the right direction. You are, you are being thrown off. I mean, I, if you run too fast, you'll notice this. You leave the ground and shoo, you're gone. Uh, fortunately, I can't run that fast. The, so, you've got these two. You've got the Newtonian force, I'll call it that, and the centrifugal force. And then, what stops the, the sun, the, the Earth, just collapsing down to a point? Well, it's... Uh, it's the forces between the particles, the matter, you know, it's, uh, oh, I, I forget the name. It's, um, it's whatever it is. <laughs> it's, a, it's something that stops us all. It stops me collapsing into a little puddle on the floor, those forces. So you've got the three. Now, for us, the dominant force outside, outside the Earth itself is the Newtonian force. The centrifugal force is pretty trivial because the velocities are low. For a neutron star, they're no longer trivial. And what you've, what you've got is you've got the spinning body. It's relatively easy to leave the surface. It gets a little bit tougher as, you, as these centrifugal forces die away because they die away a lot faster than the Newtonian type and the Newtonian type take over. Okay, so you can get off a bit and then it's a bit hard going through the, the Newtonian stuff, but uh, that di this dies away and eventually you're long off. Now, what happens is if it continues to collapse? Well, what, what you've got here is You've got two shells. This is the Kerr solution. You've got two shells. In between these two, the centrifugal force, the Newtonian force is so strong that you can't even go out at all. You are forced from there. You, you automatically uh, fall from this outer horizon to the inner horizon because of the, the uh, Newtonian forces. Once you pass that, the centrifugal forces take over, because they are the strong ones, and once you get to there, 
Then in this area, you, uh, you, in the curve solution, you can go up or down or sideways. You can go pretty much any direction you want. That, now, people look at this central circle, which is a singularity. If you take the Earth, okay, Newton's, Newton's inverse square law. Now, according to that, the closer you get to the centre, the stronger the force. But we know that's not true. I mean, this has been known for centuries, since about 2000 BC, that if you dig a hole in, the force drops off and it's zero at the centre. This is because of all the matter. Uh, in fact, uh, the force where you are is just the force from all the matter inside you. The same thing happens here. This, this singularity is just a, uh, a figment of the solution. The solution's got a singularity, so it's stuck with it. You know, you, you've got to have something. If this wasn't, if it didn't blow up at the centre, I would have discovered a solution which had no matter in it and yet had a field like a, uh, a supermassive black hole on the outside. Wouldn't that be something? God, that would take general relativity and throw it into the dust heap very fast. Because that would, well, that would be ridiculous. So, why do people say there's a singularity? Well, this is, this is what I thought at the time, and I'm sure a lot of other people thought, that this was how things were. You know, there was somebody, and lots of people have tried to calculate the interior, well, which is basically a, new, a very condensed neutron star rotating very quickly. They, that's a difficult problem, because I don't think this has been solved for real neutron stars outside black holes. It's all to do with, you know, what's happening inside? You don't know whether... Uh, it's been suggested that we send Trump to... Uh, 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 <laughs> and he can dig a hole in it. He's a very old man. We'll see. He's probably in prison with him anyway. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't say that. He's a lovely man. Anyway, that's this. Now, there, there is this paper of Penrose's, which just got a Nobel Prize, actually, for proving, not that there were singularities, if you actually read the paper, it's a, what I call a do-it-yourself paper, because you, the reader, are supposed to prove all the things that he says. But what he doesn't say is anything about singularities. He says that you can prove that there's a light ray of finite affine length, and I agree with them entirely. In fact, uh, I did prove a little theorem along those lines. Uh, oh, these are coordinates that are used by everybody. Uh, okay. In '66, Stephen Hawking came to UT. At that point, he was walking like this with his foot twisted. And I, he might have used a cane, but he, he was still getting around, quite young. And uh, he, he was coming to see George Ellis, who was there at the time. Uh, and he said that he had proved that either the universe has light rays of, with this property of having a parameter which doesn't go to infinity, or, he said, or there's a light ray that closes on itself. That would be a type like uh, going back and killing your, not you, my grandmother, you leave her alone, but your, you, whatever grandmother you want to do. Actually, I, I don't. Yes, so, well, I, I was interested in that sort of thing, and I knew a bit of topology, even taught it. So I... That weekend, I spent a couple of days seeing if I could prove what he said. He didn't tell us how he proved it. He just said he had proved it. Okay, and uh, so I told him, at the, him and George Ellis at the end of it that I couldn't prove what he said. All I could prove was like 
that you could get arbitrarily close. You tell me how close you want to get, a couple of miles, and, I, and there's one that gets to that. But I couldn't make it close up and get back to the starting point. So all I could do was, I could see my grandmother over there, but, the, uh, but I couldn't get to her. I was just shooting past her for most of the speed of light. Oh, that's how I saw it. That, that was ridiculous. So the answer was, there were light rays that had finite F on me. So I told Stephen and George this, and uh, then later that year, Stephen published this. Uh, he had no longer was claiming his theorem. Uh, and believe me, I was quite pissed off when I, he didn't acknowledge it. I never read this paper, so I don't know whether it was the same way. But in, they wrote a book full of all this topological stuff called The Large Scale Structure of Space Time. And uh, in that, I'm said to have given a name to this, a word which I didn't recognise. I'm sure I didn't, but OK. So that was the story. This, I, I wrote to George Ellis recently. I said, I've got counter examples to everything you were saying in that book. And he wrote back and asked me to send it over. So I've sent it up. Uh, the um, okay, so that's the story. What is actually happening with these light rays we're talking about is if you have an event horizon, that's a, a, a surface that you can't cross going into the future, then you're going to get light rays from one side or the other that want to cross it, but they can't. Now, the best example is. Take, take the axis, and this picture is uh, due to Alex here, Alex Goodman-Bell, who uh, did it for me a few... Yeah, there it goes. I actually cal also calculated this back in the early 60s, because that's how I knew that there were two horizons. I looked at the geodesics on the axis. Okay, what happens uh, if you send a light ray? I suppose I'm on the axis here, and the black hole's down here. If I, if I fall into the black hole, I'm going to be going down until I cross that inner horizon. Uh, what if I take my torch and shine it straight up the axis the other way? Well, that light, to me, is going upwards, but I, that just means I'm going faster than it because nothing can go up, it's actually falling. And you solve some pretty trivial differential equations, and uh, what you find is that this is the outer horizon, that's the inner horizon. And this light ray that you're looking at, this is its trajectory. It stopped, if it started at the outer horizon with zero velocity, relative to us. It was gradually falls in and it stops at the other horizon. What this means is it's asymptotic. That's uh, a good word to use. It's asymptotic as time goes to infinity. Yeah, as time goes by, it gets closer and closer to that inner horizon, but it never hits it. That's one of these light rays of finite half time length. The other one that's going straight through is, uh, I don't know, I thought, I thought it was drawn here, but it just goes straight through. Okay, it, from there. Now, what's interesting is, what happens at the other, at least I find it interesting, uh, what happens once you get through the two horizons? Well, there's a singularity there. So you've got to replace that with a nice, uh, beautiful neutron star or a supermassive black hole uh, or whatever you like. But uh, there's a body in there. You go through it along the axis as a, uh, if it's a rotating, uh, uh, actually symmetric. You go through it and you come out the other side and what you are now from the other side, because you know, this is 
a circular thing. You're coming along this way and you come up to the horizon, the inner horizon on the far side. And you can't get through that because that would take you into the, the no-no land. Here, this is no, you're not allowed to stay in there. So that's another one of these light rays of finite and fine length. The light rays from outside, a lot of them will go straight through the, hori the horizon, they'll go straight through the body, uh, and they will die on the far side of the inner horizon. So anyway, that's, that's how it all is, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, and uh, the paper's almost finished, <laughs> which is a miracle because, believe me, I've been spending for a long time there two or three hours in the morning working and then sleeping in the afternoon and then playing with my cats and watching strange uh, uh, South American, not South Korean uh, love stories with my wife, that sort of stuff. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So I'm working hard at the moment, it's just about finished. Uh, let's see, was that the last one? Oh, yes. It's exactly 57 minutes past the hour, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Can I say one last word? The, the point, the moral of this story is don't learn too much rubbish from people who think they know everything that actually were trained back in the 17th century. That's my example. Things time. Are we going to? Yes. All right, so now we just have a little switch over in our proceedings. Um, uh, so just a little. a load of dribble. Maybe it's not yeah. mine. I'll take no, it in here. Yeah, yeah, all good. Okay. Well, thank you for such a great lecture. Um, I can use this, it's fine. Um, it was absolutely fantastic and, and fantastic to hear the whole history all the way through. Um, yeah, a real treat for us. And I think the other thing that we can take away from this is around lifelong learning. You never finish, do you? You're no. always learning and you're always thinking yeah. about those academic um, problems that we all want to solve. <laughs> anyway, um, just uh, yeah. Professor Kerr will now present a special prize to a third year mathematical physics student. Now it's a um, highlight of an Oxford Canterbury Connection project as part of our 150th um, anniversary celebrations. Now, while visiting um, as an Erskine Fellow at, the, at Oxford University, Professor Wiltshire over here made short videos combining mathematics and physics with history and the unique links between Aotearoa Christchurch um, and the University of Oxford. And the videos contained uh, interesting but random facts with a weekly winner, um, whoever answered the, solution, the problem first. And I'm very intrigued um, by this very unique uh, methodology used to determine the overall winner. So the overall winner was chosen on the 28th of July using quantum mechanics, cosmic rays and a Geiger counter with dice loaded by the number of attempts, right or wrong. And I'm very pleased to say that the winner who will uh, be presented with a taonga here of six old books from a private collection is Clarinda Montilla. So Clarinda.
If that's still in use, it'll be in my will. Um, <laughs> Alright, so now um, it's open for certain questions, so we've uh, got a roaming mic, and uh, Chris, uh, of course, is going to uh, assist us in that. Alright, uh, sorry, we have an online question, just really quick. Um, so, Roy, uh, Daniel Price asks, it was a long time between Schwarzschild and Kerr, and presumably not many people thought another exact solution was possible. Do you think there is any possibility that another meaningful exact solution is out there? Yeah, that's the question one can answer. Uh, I actually rather doubt it, but that, that's not going to stop people working on, on things. You, you can do a lot with approximations, and that's the name of the game here. Uh, you know, you can assume that there's small bodies rotating around. Unfortunately, they've just discovered a supermassive black hole that's a hundred billion solar masses back towards the beginning of the universe. Unbelievably huge. One hundred billion suns all in together. So, but you can approximate that if you have a two hundred billion solar mass. A black hole a few billion miles away or a billion light years away. So mostly things are going to be done with approximations. That's, that's how LIGO works. Uh, LIGO uh, gets in signals and those signals are compared with approximate ones that are calculated uh, in a lot of cases by the methods I was talking about at the beginning. Uh, actually, recently I pointed out that if only I'd known about the Kerr black hole, I would have started with two. There's a special property that would have allowed me to start with two Kerr black holes and worked out the forces there. And uh, I said something to Thibaut de Moore, who's a Frenchman who was probably the outstanding person working in this area. And he told me, the yeah, uh, in the last very short time, somebody was doing this Kirchhoff approximation. So what I'm saying is, no, I don't think, I don't think there's a significant change. So be, you can add in electromagnetism, or you can add in other fields, and you get similar results. But the big one is. Uh, well, actually, the big one is charged supermassive black holes, I suppose. Yeah, okay. Question right there. Yeah, do you think the, from the point of view of science history, do you think the science is always, scientific theories is always falsified by the later theory? Like, there's no objective truth? Sorry, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Do you think the is always the scientific theory always falsified by the theory coming afterwards and uh, there's no objective truth because recently there's a term called relativism do you think it's kind of a abusive usage of relativity in social science let's see very good to say what we might hear today it's failed <laughs> I'm sorry, I just want to know, um, using it as a scientific history, is it, scientific theory always falsified by the physical theory some afterwards? Or there is... With, oh, theory first. Well... It's always coming to the entry. You are making progress towards the objective truth. Recently, there's something called the relativity. Do you think it's kind of an abusive usage of relativity? Yes. Yeah. So the science. Then there's yeah. no yeah. objective. Yeah. And 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 they two came together. Relative, my solution came at exactly the right moment for uh, the first supermassive black hole disappearing. Uh, oh, I've forgotten the word. The uh, quasars. They turned out to be great big objects. And uh, you know, it was a situation where they didn't think they didn't take any notice of 
my, my results. Uh, but within a year or so, it was realized that it's the accretion disk around the spinning black hole where all the matter is, but is coming in, but the accretion disk is hot. You've all seen pictures of, of uh, a, a light, a, an area full of light and energy around black holes in the pictures you see this. And so in that case, the two of them came together. But in other cases, the theory has come first. Uh, not in general relativity so much. But. And uh, obviously, uh, we saw the planets moving before we had an actual theory. But, uh, so I, I, it, they two go along, alternating back and forth. Uh, are there any further questions? Any questions on Zoom? Uh, Bob Hurst. Okay. Um, a rotating curve like yeah. <laughs> does, does not radiate gravitational radiation. Is that correct? Oh, no. No, no. So it's essentially a, stat a static solution. It's not technically it's stationary. Yes. yes. That it's uh, very special. Okay. But it's, it's, yeah, it's station. No, no change in time. Yes, yes. Okay. So if uh, an astronomical body collapses into a black hole, it's unlikely to be perfectly um, circular symmetrical. Ah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, another New Zealander, David Robinson, actually, was the first one to show that. Whenever you have a black a collapsed body like that, it it approaches mass solution rather quickly. Yeah. That, because no information can get out from the inside. Nothing can cross the uh, what I call the uh, event shell, the thick area around. So uh, you don't know what's going on inside. They would be plotting anything. <laughs> um, so that's why my solution is even more important than the book. I love to read the books and by the way. <laughs> and that is one theory I am not going to try and disprove. <laughs> okay. There not are oh, there is a question here? Uh, same to my professor, uh, it is in all his here to uh, listen to your talk. Uh, I want to ask you, what do you see as the relationship between mathematics and physics? And what's your advice to any who wants to be a theoretical physicist in the future? Yeah, well, say the same thing about that. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm going to have to change the Well, obviously, physics uses mathematics, and physics wouldn't be where it is today without mathematics. But then, perhaps the other way around, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of things that are probably picked up by, by mathematicians from looking at the universe and from physics. I can't honestly think of one. <laughs> if I don't say that, my mathematical friends are going to hit me. <laughs> it's, look, physics was always a big part of mathematics. It's a part of mathematics. Places like Cambridge, if you go back another few hundred years, they were full of mathematicians doing applied mathematics because that was how you could understand the universe. Another question at the front. Uh, you mentioned that people actually were not taking your um, solution seriously. Yeah. When did they start paying more attention? Oh, all, all the relativists went crazy because they have gone crazy over what's called nut space, never multi-tamberino space. 
And that was very good at this and they were very old, right? All sorts of things with them because they had nothing else to work with. You know? If that's all you've got, you can work with them. If you've only got one leg and that's only that long, you're going to hop along on it. <laughs> so, sorry, that's no So, Roy, we've got another question on uh, Zoom from Daniel Price. There's been some interest, recent interest in linking black holes to accelerated expansion of the universe, justified by there being no solution where the Kerr metric maps to the FLRW metric instead of an asymptotically flat exterior. Any thoughts on this? <laughs> 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 Were you telling me them not to take any notice? Because <laughs> I didn't hear it. <laughs> so, so th there been some recent, uh, there's been some recent interest in linking black holes to accelerated expansion of the universe, justified by there being no solution where the Kerr metric maps to the FRW metric instead of an asymptotically flat exterior. Any thoughts on this? Yes, I'm glad you asked me because I was going to talk about Now, you see, the problem I've got is that I don't believe people. If I see a paper which claims something, I'm going to look to see if it's true or not. And in the majority of cases, the answer is going to be no. Now, people have talked about the universe, universe being uh, homogeneous and isotropic. In all directions, it looks the same. Look, if Gina Lollabagida walked past me, I knew there was a difference in directions. <laughs> anyway, everything looked the same in all directions and, and from any point. Well, obviously, that's not true of the universe because we're not the same as empty space. But it was claimed to be true on average. It was all smooth, whatever average meant. Now, David is one of the few people who was attacking this idea of homogeneous and isotropic. And I am, was always supportive of him in this. The only thing was that I didn't think he was going far enough. And what do we see now? Well, the universe is so homogeneous and isotropic. I, I have to interrupt because I think he's asking about something else, which I, I actually disagree with as well. But anyway. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm going to finish. He, he, he. <laughs> back, back halfway back to the Big Bang, there are voids, areas of very low density, which are two billion light years across. Two billion. There are structures which are two billion light years long. What, what, what happens with gravity? And this is what people don't allow for enough, is gravity is, it clumps, it always clumps, it's, uh, if you have positive and negative particles, they don't tend to clump, but if they're all attracting each other, then as soon as somebody gets slightly the upper hand in his area, they're going to suck away all these poor fish into his, their own little pool. So, now, if they were, there were areas of voids two billion light years across, seven billion light years ago, what size are they now? Four billion light years? If we were in one of those, we would think, we would see all the matter streaming away from us. How the hell does, if it wasn't streaming away from us, how does it get into the clumps? And what we'd, we would call that would be uh, dark energy. So, in my opinion, dark energy is just a load of codswallop, and all that we're seeing is that we are in an area of low density with, the, for a long time, a very large area streaming away. David, I think it was David, told me recently of something that I, I was very pleased to hear, and that is somebody did a calc uh, observations on how, many, how much matter is above the ecliptic plane 
in, not in their galaxy, but elsewhere, how much is below. And they found, well, there's more above than below. And that's exactly what I was, I think a number of years ago, I suggested to Dave that that was something that we should be looking at. Because that, if that's the case, that's really showing us how non-isotropic the universe is. Uh, you should never believe any cosmologist who tells you anything. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly me. I, what was yes. the question? Well, <laughs> the, 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 the question is... <laughs> I think this is indeed a good place to stop. <laughs> so, so please all join your hands together. Thank you. And I didn't have to ask David for any names, I just made them up. <laughs> <laughs>